Okay, so we're going to go ahead and now jump into session 11. The title of session 11 is The Apostasy, Phase 1, and this is, again, session 11 of our class, Understanding the End Times. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, and we're going to just jump in with what Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. As you can just feel as you read this, the um, the, the grief that he feels, and he's talking, and, and I'll actually just start with verse 1. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. Now listen to this. I want you to hear what is going to lead the bride of Christ away from the person of Jesus Christ. The simple, pure devotion to Jesus Christ, the person, the man, Jesus. He says in verse 4, he says, If one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached. See, I tell you, in the first century, Paul had the very same problem that we are gonna, we're having right now. It's been a demonically designed strategy, a hell-inspired strategy, not to, uh, not to stop preaching Jesus, but to preach another version of Jesus. Notice what Paul says. For if another one comes and preach, or if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached. See, it's the preaching of another Jesus that's not in accordance with how he's been revealed in Scripture that leads to great deception, that leads to the bride being defiled, that leads to apostasy. And as we talk about phase one of the apostasy, it's patterned after what Jeroboam did in ancient Israel is he didn't preach Baal and Asherah. He didn't preach Molech. He didn't preach Isis. He preached Jehovah 2.0. He preached Yahweh 2.0. It was another version of the same God. And so we're seeing this very same thing taking place right now in the church of Jesus Christ. And I believe we've seen it for the past couple decades. I mean, it's always been around, but it has really intensified in the past couple of decades as the, an, another Jesus is being preached. It's still the name of Jesus Christ. It's still coming from the word. But what's disturbing about the preaching of another Jesus are the things in scripture that are not being said. It's not so much what's being said, it's what's not being said that's disturbing. It's, it's what's not being spoken that is so disturbing. And so anyway, Paul is talking and he says, If one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear it beautifully. In other words, you see three things happening. The preaching of another Jesus the preaching of a different gospel, and the preaching of a different spirit. Those three things are creating an apostasy. And I believe as we talk about phase one of the apostasy that is now underway, I believe it's been underway for, I don't know, a, de a few decades, uh, but it's really intensifying as now Christians, many, once loyal Christ followers are deconstructing and they're walking away from their faith and so much of it has to do with the preaching of another Jesus. Now you think about this, if, if you get on an airplane and the plane is one degree off course and you're flying from JFK in New York City to LAX in Los Angeles, if your plane is one degree off, co off course, you're going to end up in the, uh, the ocean when you land in, in California. See, one degree off course it affects so much. The preaching of another Jesus is leading the church into the apostasy. And so we've got to be very careful who we read, who we listen to. I'm not saying you get into fear. I'm not saying you get into this, this bent of suspicion and criticism and judgment. But I'm saying you got to be very careful who you listen to. you got to be very careful who you uh, listen to even in worship. The worship movement right now is an absolute wreck. It's an absolute mess. Uh, another Jesus is being worshipped in the worship movement. 
bands and brands are being idolized and the person of Christ is that has been pushed aside. God is recovering the worship movement. But I'm saying even in the worship movement, you see this apostasy taking place. See, when, we're, when leaders are unwilling to die to their own selfish ambitions and we want to fit Jesus into our own life, then what happens is, and not even the audiences that preachers will preach to, so much of what's happened, of this preaching of another Jesus, phase one of the apostasy, so much of the reason that's happening is because the audiences we're trying, leaders are speaking to, they're speaking to an audience that says, we only want Jesus, we want to fit Jesus into our life rather than Jesus becoming our life we therefore have itching ears and our ears only want to hear what we want to hear that will accommodate our lifestyle so we can fit Jesus into our lifestyle. And therefore there's preachers they accumulate based on their itching ears who will preach what they want to hear. Cherry pick scripture verses that give a slanted, distorted view of the real Jesus. So it's just like what we saw in the days of Jeroboam. A golden calf. Well, another, it's just like in the days of Aaron. A golden calf. It's not Baal or Asherah. It's not Isis or Molech. It is another version of Yahweh. This is your God. Worship him. And so, anyway, this phase one of the apostasy, as preachers want to be more culturally relevant and more, uh, they want to be more applicable to this tolerant culture as they're forming and fashioning a Jesus 2.0. I call them Jesus 2.0. Like Jeroboam is, is we want to fashion a God of convenience that's convenient for the seeker. Sounds a lot like seeker sensitive, doesn't it? Seeker sensitive Christianity. We want to be, we want to be very seeker oriented, very user friendly. We want to we, want to, we don't want to say certain words because it might offend the seeker. We want to be more palatable to them. They, you know, they've never heard these things before. And I understand there's a time and a place to uh, speak a certain way. But what's happened is through the watered down, seeker sensitive gospel, another Jesus has been preached. Another Jesus is being preached. I, I call it Jesus 2.0. It's not... It's not Allah. We're not saying go worship Allah. We're not saying go worship Buddha. We're, we're not saying go back under the Torah. We're, it's Jesus 2.0. We're going we're gonna to really stress and focus on the good sides of God we like. You know, his kindness, his grace, his love, his tolerance, his understanding, his blessings, his prosperity. You know, all the good things we like about Jesus, we're going to focus on those, his goodness. We're not going to, the, the, the so-called negative things that are in the scriptures, we're just, you know, we're not going to preach against it. We're just going to ignore it. And so what happens is uh, when you ignore the full counsel of God's word, you end up with another Jesus. You end up one degree off course, crashed in the Pacific Ocean. We, we've got to preach the full revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things that must shortly take place. We've got to preach Jesus as he's revealed in Scripture. We, we do not have the luxury to cherry pick the things we like about him and the things we don't like. You know, so much of the church is just flat out embarrassed that Jesus, that God, would send people to hell. The church is flat out embarrassed that Jesus would release judgments upon the earth. The, the, the church is flat out embarrassed that there is a day of wrath, a day of the Lord coming upon sinners. We've lost the fear of the Lord because we want to be more culturally relevant. And the problem is we have formed and fashioned a Jesus 2.0. That's phase one of the apostasy. And we're going to get into this in a lot more detail. You know, um, if, if I think about, just to kind of give you a comparison and a contrast between Jesus 2.0 and the real Jesus, here's the way I think about it is Jesus 2.0 says, I came to give you life. I came to give you my blessings. I came to give you prosperity. 
And they quote John 10.10. 10. Jesus came to give us life. Jesus came to give us a better life. Jesus came to fulfill our destiny. Jesus came to do that. And, and John 10.10 10 is not talking about Jesus giving you a better life. Well, I mean, he is, but not like we think. The better life, Jesus, the, the real Jesus says, I came to give you abundant life, my life in you. I didn't come to, from heaven to earth to be a Santa Claus that just blesses you. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't bless us. He does bless us. But G, the real Jesus says, I came to put my divine life, my uncreated life, the, li the indestructible life of God, the life of the Spirit of God. I came to put my life inside of you so that you would be conformed into the image of God. You would be conformed into the image of Christ and that life of God on the inside of you would then overflow. And as you begin to seek the kingdom of God first, and you begin to seek my righteousness first, then I will bless you. Then I will add those things to you. You see the difference between Jesus 2.0 and the real Jesus? Jesus 2.0 says, I came to bless you. The real Jesus says, I came to put my life in you. Very different. Jesus 2.0 says, I want to give you your best life now. I want to help you have a life of happiness, a life of blessings, a life of influence, a life of wide open doors, of opportunity. I, in other words, Jesus 2.0 says, I want to take yourself and make you a better version of you. Isn't that being preached in the church today? Jesus has no interest. The real Jesus has no interest in making you a better version of you. He wants to put to death your self-life and resurrect within you his life so that his life might be the governing life source you live by. It's a very different, uh, very different message. So Jesus 2.0 says, I exist to make you happy. The real Jesus says, if you want to be happy, if you want to be really blessed, become poor in spirit. Embrace uh, poverty of spirit. That doesn't mean we embrace poverty. It means we have this disposition within us that says, I am so in need of God. I'm so desperate for God. If you have that attitude, Jesus says you'll be happy. If you really want to be happy, then embrace purity of heart. The pure in heart, they will see God. If you really want to be happy, if you really want to be blessed, in, in fact, that word blessed in the Greek means happy Ble in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure in heart. Happy are the pure in heart. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who are persecuted. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Happy are those who mourn over their condition. So if you really want the blessed, happy life, it's not by you having your best life now. It's by you having the character attributes Jesus outlines for us in the Sermon on the Mount. Page two in our notes is Jesus says, Jesus 2.0 says, I want to help you fulfill your destiny. The real Jesus says, you have no destiny apart from me. Your destiny is tied to God's eternal purpose in me. Will you surrender what you want me to do for you so that I can be what I want to be in you? See, it's very different. Jesus 2.0 says you have a destiny. And that destiny is always seems to be like you going off and doing things for God. I'm not, I'm not saying we don't do things for God. We do. But, but God's destiny for us is tied into the person of Jesus Christ. God's destiny for us is tied to the great eternal purpose of God in Christ Jesus is that we would have his eternal plan and purpose. Our destiny is to be what God has ultimately created us to be, his mature sons conformed to the image of Christ, his bride made ready by inward preparation, that we would be the mature sons of God for the Father. We would be a worthy bride for the Son. We would be a temple the Holy Spirit fills and possesses a spiritual house that he dwells in. See, God's destiny for you is tied into Jesus Christ. It's not like I'm going to go just give you these gifts and you're going to go run around the world fulfilling your destiny apart from me. That's not what Jesus is about. Jesus 2.0 says... 
You don't need to repent or you don't need to confess your sins because you're under grace. My blood has already forgiven you of all your sins. Just believe. The real Jesus calls us to repentance. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, even to the churches in uh, Asia Minor, repent. You've You've left your first love. Repent. You're lukewarm. Repent. You're apathetic. Repent. You've tolerated Jezebel. See, the real Jesus says, repent and return, confess your sins, and my blood will cleanse you and restore you to fellowship with God. Jesus 2.0 says, relax. The words I spoke before the cross, those were for the, the Jews living under the law. Things like the Sermon on the Mount and take up your cross. You know, those hard things that seem demanding and, you know, we don't like that talk about sacrifice and suffering. Relax, guys. That was for the Jews who lived under the law. You know, for you and the new covenant, it's very much different. I paid the price so that you don't have to pay any price. And so, you know, just relax about all that stuff because it was all old covenant teaching. The real Jesus said after his resurrection to the disciples, you go and teach the nations all I have taught you, which includes the Sermon on the Mount, which includes taking up your cross and following me, which includes embracing the cross life as God works to uh, crucify self. Jesus 2.0 says, hey guys, I'm always in a good mood when I think about you. I'm always in a good mood when I think about you. Now, obviously God loves us beyond anything we could ever imagine. God does take joy in us. He does take pleasure. But God's not always in a good mood when he thinks about us. I'm sorry. Read Revelation 2 and 3. The real Jesus said, you know, real Jesus says, I am joyful and I am glad, but I'm not always in a good mood when I think about the condition of my church. Have you not read Revelation 2 and 3 when I rebuked the church of Ephesus because they left their first love? Have you not read what I said to Laodicea? I will spit you out of my mouth. Have you not read what I said to the church of Sardis is that your your wedding garments are stained and you must overcome? Have you not read what I said to the church of Thyatira? You're tolerating Jezebel and you must repent. God is, Jesus is not always in a good mood when he thinks about the condition of his church. That is not true. Jesus 2.0 says, hey, don't judge anyone, but love everyone. Tolerate those who are different from you. You should not judge anyone. The real Jesus says, don't judge with hypocrisy. Don't judge with pride or criticism or don't judge in unrighteousness. Look at yourself first. Humbly deal with your own issues. Then you will have then you'll have the ability to speak the truth and to judge others righteously after you have looked at your own issues. The real Jesus never said don't judge. That is an absolute misinterpretation of Scripture that's being preached by many. That that is another Jesus. Jesus 2.0 says, I am not like the God of the Old Testament who judged people for their idolatry, who judged people for their immorality, um, that I waged war against the pagan nations. I'm not, that is not like me. That's not me. The real Jesus says, did you not read Revelation 5 through 19? (laughs) Have you not read that? Where I am going to break, the, the, the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world is going to break the seals of God, and he's going to release judgment on the nations who do not turn from their wicked sins and their wicked ways. The day of the Lord is coming upon the nations for their, for their idolatry and their immorality and their blasphemy. Have you not read what's going to happen? That, you know, one-fourth of the earth could die, one half of the earth, whatever the, the, the final one half of the earth will die in the day of the Lord judgments because the day of the Lord is just like the days of Noah. 
Have you not read that? The day of the Lord will be just like the days of Noah. They were eating, they were drinking, they were sleeping, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage, they were going about life as usual, business as usual. They were going about their day just like as normal until the day Noah went into the ark and they did not understand that the flood came and took them all away. Have you not read that? Because the day of the Lord is going to be just like the days of Noah. God's judgments are coming upon the earth. And to not preach the, the coming judgments of God that the Lamb of God will break. He is the Lion and the Lamb. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God sacrificed for our sins. To not preach the coming judgments of God that the Lion of Judah is going to unleash is to preach another Jesus. It's not popular. It's not a popular message. A lot of the church doesn't want to hear that form of, of Jesus. But have you not read Isaiah 63? Have you not read Revelation 19 that says Jesus is going to be covered in the blood of his enemies? He's coming as a mighty warrior back to the earth. He's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is going to wage war against his enemies. That is the Jesus we worship. This idea that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are different gods, that is just false doctrine. Absolute false doctrine. God himself is a warrior God. God himself is going to take vengeance on his enemies. And that should put the fear of God in us. That should put the fear of the Lord in us. Jesus 2.0, and, and uh, Jesus 2.0 says, because of the new covenant, you need to unhit yourself from the Old Testament, including the Ten Commandments. The real Jesus says, speaking from the Sermon on the Mount, truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one stroke or, or tittle from the law will pass away until all is accomplished. You think that looking on a woman, to, you, you think that, uh, uh, you've heard it said that uh, adultery, that you should not commit adultery, the physical act of adultery, but I say to you, if you even look at a woman to lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. You say that, you know, we shouldn't commit the physical act of murder. But I say, if you have hate or bitterness in your heart or anger in your heart towards another, you're, you're a murderer. See, Jesus did not do away with the high standard of the law. He raised it up to his intention. And that intention is to be fulfilled by the Spirit of God who dwells inside of you. He never lowered the standard in the new covenant. He raised it up to the standard it should have always been at, but was impossible when it just existed only in the form of external commandments. See, Jesus 2.0 says, a loving God will never send people to hell just because they wouldn't believe in me. But the real Jesus says, my father who is a God of love and a God of justice sent me to die as the atonement for the sins of the world so that God would remain just and the justifier of all who have faith in him. That, God, that his sacrificial death, because of his sacrificial death, no one has to spend eternity in the lake of fire. Because of his, because of his indwelling life, we can overcome the sin nature that is passed down to us in Adam. See, I think, I think you, you can see now, again, the, the good sides that we like, God's love, God's kindness, God's grace, God's goodness, God's blessings, God's healing, all of that are absolutely true. And we don't need to go to the other side of the pendulum because we're focused on the, the so-called, they're not negative, but the church sees them as negative attributes. Paul said, behold, the kindness and the severity of God. We got to know the Lord in both. We got to know him as he is. I want to know the Lord as he is, not in just the good side that I think is good. I want to know him as scripture reveals him to be. He's God. By all means, he's God. That we have our, our next breath and our lungs because God gives us that breath. We have the next beat in our heart because God gives us that beat of our heart. He's God. We don't get to make him into our own image. We don't get to fashion him into the profile we want him to be in. See, 
there's, if you think about the false prophet in Revelation 13, whatever form the false prophet ultimately takes, whether it's a, a pope, whether it's the uh, Muslim Mahdi who poses as another Jesus, um, or, or not even the Mahdi, the, the, the false prophet, the false version of Jesus in Islam, whatever form that false prophet ultimately takes, one thing we know about the false prophet is he has two horns like a lamb. In other words, he derives, horns are symbolic of authority in scripture. The false prophet derives his authority as a lamb as another Jesus. Whether he's preaching another Jesus, whether he's proclaiming himself to be uh, Jesus, We'll see how that ultimately works out. But the point is, he derives his authority by preaching and proclaiming another Jesus, but inwardly he speaks as a dragon. He's, a, he's a two horns of a lamb and he speaks as a dragon. In other words, the, the hell's strategy to bring in the fullness of the apostasy at the end of the age is to use another Jesus. And we're well on the way towards that. Another Jesus has been preached in the nations for many years, for decades. And it's going to only intensify. But it's showing us the strategy of hell that, that, that Satan wants to raise up. A false prophet that preaches another Jesus, that derives his authority by preaching another Jesus. And you know, Matthew 24, the thing that Jesus said... He said, and the disciples said, okay, what are the signs of the age? What are the, what are the signs of the end times and the um, end of the age? And Jesus told them, he said, see to it that no one deceives you. The very first thing Jesus said, the very first warning Jesus gave was not about the abomination of desolation, was not about the harlot Babylon, was not about earthquakes or whatever, pestilence. The very first thing Jesus warned the disciples about was see to it that you're not deceived. Many are going to come in my name and they're going to say, I am the Christ, but they're going to mislead many. I believe he's saying there, he's, many are going to come preaching another Jesus. They're going to be coming preaching in his name. They're going to come uh, proclaiming to you the scriptures and his name. But beware because there will be a preaching of another Jesus. And if you're not careful, you'll be deceived by that preaching. I'm seeing it all over the place right now. So much of the church is being led astray by a, another Jesus that is not the full counsel of Jesus or the full revelation of Jesus as revealed in the scriptures. Be careful. Be careful of that. That's, that's the warning of the Lord to us as we head deeper into the end times. Another Jesus will be preached. Still talking about phase one of the apostasy as Paul said in 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit explicitly says, this is a prophecy that Paul, Paul doesn't always write with prophecy. You know, if you read the book of Isaiah, pretty much the whole book of Isaiah is, thus says the Lord, thus declares the Lord, the Lord says this, the Lord says that. Paul as an apostle is not always writing in a uh, prophetic oracle kind of way. But here in 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul says, the Spirit explicitly says, in other words, the Spirit has given an explicit warning to us that in latter times, which are undoubtedly the times that we live in right now, some are going to depart from the faith because they paid attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, we've talked about this a lot, as, as I believe, if you think about this, you think about Aaron when he crafted that golden calf. Again, it was not another god like Molech or Isis or Baal. It was Jehovah, Yahweh 2.0. This is your God who brought you out of Egypt. In other words, they wanted a more palatable, manageable, less intense, more relatable version of God, of Yahweh they could relate to. And so Aaron did what a lot of leaders do. He took up the golden earrings from the people and they took their golden earrings. They took their treasures to themselves and they, they fashioned this idol based on the treasures of people. That's what's happening today. 
Many ministers are preaching another Jesus that is fashioned by the treasures of what people have in their own heart. And the, the gold that we're using are doctrines of devils. Doctrines of demons are like the golden earrings the, that Aaron used to fashion this golden calf. This golden idol of worship are, are like the, the doctrines of demons, cherry-picked verses of Scripture here and there. I like this part about Jesus, the part where he turns over tables in the temple. We're going to leave that out. I like this way he heals and he delivers and he gives grace. But this whole thing about judgment and the book of Revelation, we're just going to leave that out. I like how the, that Jesus will bless us and he'll give us prosperity. But this whole thing about demanding the, the cru crucified life, we're just going to leave that out. Doctrines of demons are leading to the departure from the faith. What are those doctrines of demons that are really gaining momentum in the day we live? I think of three of them. I'm sure there's more. I think of three just that come right out right to the top of my head. Number one, hyper grace. Number two, partial preterism. Number three, dominionism. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But hyper grace, uh, if you haven't read Michael Brown, Dr. Michael Brown's book called Hyper Grace, I highly recommend that book. It is an excellent book. It's, it's a book, every, to me, every Christian should get a hold of that book and read it. It, is, it really uh, drills into the false teaching of grace, which, listen, grace is so beautiful. Grace is so awesome. I mean, just thank God for his amazing grace. I mean, how much of us, we just need, we don't need less grace, we need more grace. We don't need less grace preached, we need more grace preached. But the, uh, the error of hyper-grace teaching is taking the beautiful message of the grace of God to an unbiblical extreme that begins to form another doctrine that is not consistent with Scripture. I remember when the first time I came head on into hyper grace was probably, I'm trying to think, probably 10 or, 10 or so years ago. A friend of mine said, hey, man, you need to check out this book. I, I've been, I've been you know, reading this book. It's really good. This guy, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's teaching on God's grace. I know he's a little bit of a prosperity kind of preacher, but the stuff he's saying is really good. I highly recommend this book. And so I, I had never, and to be honest, back then I didn't, didn't know even the word hyper grace was not in my vocabulary. But I bought the book and I started reading it. And, you know, my, my experience reading it was somewhat like I read it on my Kindle. And I was reading it and was like, okay, you know, okay, this part is good. I was like, oh, this is really good. Oh, you know, highlight this, highlight that. And then, then another statement would be, man, I'd be like, What? That's not scriptural. And so reading the book like that was like really good, really good. That is so unbiblical. Good, 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 unbiblical. Good, 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 unbiblical. But at the end of the day, this, this teacher was forming an entirely different doctrine that was not in scripture. And so that gave me the first realization into hyper grace. But hyper grace is spreading like, like wildfire today, not only in America, not only in Europe, not only in Australia, but around the world, hyper grace teaching. And, you know, I don't have the time to go into the full breakdown of what is good about hyper grace and what's not good, but I would definitely recommend Michael Brown's book on the book, uh, Hyper Grace. But just to give you kind of just a really brief overview of hyper grace and how it's leading to an, the apostasy is, is uh, hyper grace teachers are now saying Christians no longer need to confess our sins because we've already been forgiven. In fact, if you, if you sin, if you go look at pornography and you go and you ask God to forgive you, you're actually sinning more because you are in the, the sin of unbelief. Because your sins have already been paid for. So you can go look at, basically, you can go look at pornography or you can go speak gossip against your neighbor or you can go steal something. And you, when you come to God and you approach God, there's no need to uh, confess your sins. There's no need to repent because you're already under the blood of Jesus. And if you acknowledge that or you confess it, then you're actually sinning worse because you're in the sin of unbelief. That, that actually is being taught by many around the world. That is absolute error. 
Hyper grace teachers also, they teach that born again believers are made perfectly, totally, and for, forever holy in God's sight the moment they are saved. No matter what we do after our conversion, no matter how we live after our conversion, we became righteous in God's eyes once and for all when we were justified by the Holy Spirit, or justified, and the Holy Spirit came to dwell within us. And so in this false teaching, there's no place for sanctification. There's no place of sanctification being a process that makes us holy. In other words, what hyper-grace teachers do is they blend together, and you won't notice this unless you really study it, but I, that's what I walked away from, is they, they take the, the beautiful doctrine of justification, the beautiful reality of justification, that you are justified by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, and your sins have been forgiven legally, and they merge together justification and sanctification to say that you are forever holy and God sees you forever righteous without, even without you living a sanctified holy life. Through God's eyes, he sees you always holy. That again is another serious error. God does not always see you as holy. We are justified. He sees us in Christ. That's right. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. But sanctification, God does not just want us to, to remain declared legally righteous. He wants us to become actually righteous in how we live and how the life of Christ flows out of us. Another thing, they, <clears throat> building upon this idea that God only sees you as holy. God only sees you as righteous. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see the things you do. Building upon that idea is hyper-grace teachers say, there's nothing you can do to please God. There's no way you can live to please God. In fact, if you try to please God, you will become like a Pharisee. You will become legalistic. You will become religious. That again is another error. Paul said, find out what pleases the Lord. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we aim to be pleasing in his sight. <clears throat> so it is absolutely unscriptural what they teach. <clears throat> Excuse me. Building upon that. So you see what happens is they build upon one teaching after another. But building upon this idea that God only sees you as holy. You don't have to do anything to please him. Therefore, they form a doctrine that says God's always in a good mood when he thinks about you. God's always in a good mood when he thinks about your life. Now, again, I'm not minimizing at all the power of justification and the power of God's love and the power of grace. Listen, I live by that 24-7. I mean, I, that is my life source, are those beautiful doctrines of justification, the indwelling life of Christ, the grace of God. I'm just saying that God does not always, God is not always in a good mood when he thinks about us. Just read Revelation 2 and 3. So that's hyper grace. Again, if you want more detail, I highly recommend Dr. Brown's book, Hyper Grace. The, the, the next thing I'll say is the, the, a doctrine that goes hand in hand with hyper grace is partial preterism. And we talked about that in one of our earlier sessions, the idea that all prophecies have been fulfilled before or fulfilled in 70 AD. And it really goes along with hyper grace so well, because you think about this, hyper grace does not want to talk about the judgments of God. Hyper grace does not want to talk about the call to take up our cross. Hyper grace does not want to talk about suffering that Christians, that Christians are called to sometimes endure. And so because of that, partial preterism fits so well with that teaching of hyper grace because partial preterism says, well, you know, the judgments of God have already been fulfilled in 70 AD. And so, you know, in, you know we, we're not going to, things are not getting worse Things are getting better. I don't see how any partial preterist person, believer, one who believes in that, can honestly look at the world right now and think things are getting better. And in fact, if you say a message like this would be labeled, doom, I'm a doom and gloom prophet. I'm a doom and gloom prophet. You're a doom and gloom prophet, Brian, because you're talking about what the book of Revelation says, that stuff's already been fulfilled. You're just a doom and gloom prophet. Things are not getting worse. Things are getting better. You're just negative. You need to, you're always pessimistic. And I just don't 
see that. I just don't see that in scripture. I don't see it in reality. I mean, you can't really tell me. I'm looking at our nation. I'm looking at the depravity of our nation. I'm looking at the legalization and normalization of the LGBTQ agenda in our nation around the world. And you're telling me things are getting better. I'm like, no, absolutely not. Now that again, my view of the end times has always been the end times are going to be the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. It's going to be a time of deep darkness and increasing glory. It's going to be a time where the wheat mature into Christ's likeness, which is going to be incredible, but the tares are also going to be mature at the same time. The harvest at the end of the age is both the maturing of, of wickedness and righteousness at the same time. So I don't think it's going to be everything's always going to be getting better. God's glory is going to be poured out. God's uh, Holy Spirit is going to be uh, poured out. He is going to fulfill his ultimate intention. But things are not always going to be getting better. In fact, we're going to see things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse. Now, that doesn't mean, it is. but even though things get worse, things are going to get better in, what, in terms of what God does in his church, which is glorious. It's the, the, the end times are the church's finest hour. So when you combine hyper grace with partial preterism, the effect of this is God is going to use the trials of the great tribulation, the trials of the tribulation period, the trials of the seventh kingdom and the eighth kingdom. God is going to use these two satanic antichrist kingdoms to purify and make white and make ready the bride of Jesus Christ. God is through many tribulations we enter the kingdom of God. And so God is going to use trials. God's going to use fire. God's going to use these different things to bring about the fulfillment of his ultimate intention, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so the, the doctrine of partial preterism leaves the church unprepared for the great shaking that's coming before the Lord returns. It could even lead to an apostasy. If you think about this, if, if, you're, if you've been groomed under this teaching, I think we probably saw a good example of this in 2020. You're groomed under partial preterist teaching where things are going to get better. Things are going to improve. You know, just anything negative is doom and gloom. And you come into 2020 and the pandemic hits and the economy shuts down and we're in lockdown mode and governments are overreaching and they want to bring in the great reset and all these different things are happening. And partial preterism is but what you have fed upon. It would be very easy when that shaking comes and intensifies for many believers to just walk away and say, I was always told these things are going to get better. I was always told things were going to get easier. And so I, I see that hyper grace combined with partial preterism could actually fuel this end time apostasy. The third thing I'll bring, to, I'll bring in, which I believe works hand in hand, is hyper grace, partial preterism, and dominionism. And we talked about this in two sessions, um, otherwise known as a seven mountain mandate where the church is going to, through a great revival marked by signs and wonders and miracles, is going to take dominion over the nations and is going to transform the culture in the nations. That this, these three things, hyper grace, partial preterism and dominionism or seven mountain mandate are like a cord of three strands that work together that I believe could actually fuel the end time apostasy. Because you see what happens is this, this whole movement of dominionism gets our focus off of, of Christ the person and our own relationship with him and our own inward transformation that's required in the bride, it gets our focus off of inward transformation and it gets our focus onto the externals. The externals like signs and wonders. The externals like revival. Again, I'm, I, I'm, I've said this a million times. I am 100% in favor of signs and wonders, 100% in favor of miracles, 100% behind the idea of a revival. I just don't think God is so much interested in transforming nations as he is in transforming hearts. And so the thing about this dominion thing, it gets us so focused on the externals. It gets us so focused on kingdom advancement that we miss the internal work God wants to do within his people 
And so therefore, it gets us distracted from our relationship with the Lord. In fact, you know, I think one of the dangers of dominionism, one of the dangers of this idea that there's going to be a great revival that's going to conquer all the nations and Christianize the nations, well, how is this going to happen? Well, it's going to happen by these incredible signs and wonders, these, these incredible miracles that are going to take place that people are going to look at and they're going to say, that's truly a work of God because of the miracle. The danger of that is the Antichrist and the false prophet are also going to move in miracles. And if miracles become the litmus test for how we approve something being of God or not of God, then we're going to fall into great deception. Again, that doesn't mean we, we have a fear of signs and wonders. No, we should actually be pursuing, as we pursue Jesus Christ and a relationship with Jesus Christ, and as we preach Jesus Christ, and as he, Jesus Christ is our message, signs and wonders will follow. But signs and wonders are never meant to be our message. Signs and wonders are never be, meant to be the litmus test of whether or not we're preaching the true gospel. Signs and wonders are God testifying of who he is, but it also the, the greatest testif, testif, testimony of who he is is that we actually have the love of Jesus Christ. They will know that you're my disciples, not by the signs and wonders you perform, but by the love you operate in. Again, I'm all for signs and wonders. I'm all for miracles. But I'm, I'm hitting at the focus of the external, the litmus test that says that it's only a move of God if there's signs and wonders. This is really big in the African church. I know we do a lot of ministry with pastors in Africa. I mean, you are... You want to talk about being at the low, lowest tier of recognition in the African church. If you don't do signs and wonders and you don't do miracles and healing like the guy who fills the stadiums, if you don't do those kind of miracle wonders, then you're not even really a preacher of the gospel. I mean, it's even bigger in Africa. So I want to say that signs and wonders are not the litmus test of whether or not we're preaching the gospel. Signs and wonders are not the litmus test of whether or not we're godly or have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Antichrist and the false prophet are going to move in signs and wonders. Paul said, Paul said, talking about this signs and wonders movement, Paul said that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, Paul said that the coming of the man of lawlessness is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. See, notice that. The Antichrist is going to move in false signs, in power, and in wonders. In fact, the Antichrist is going to be resurrected and raised from the dead, mimicking the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is going to fuel the worship of the Antichrist in the nations. I mean, can you imagine this world leader suffers a fatal wound and dies, and then he's resurrected, mimicking the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You know, and the nations are going to look at him, and they're going to be like, who is like him? He's raised from the dead. He performs signs and wonders. He performs miracles. And I believe, sadly... A lot of the church who, who believes that signs and wonders are the ultimate apex of Christianity and the ultimate testimony that we're preaching the gospel, I believe those who are so addicted to the external signs and wonders are going to fall hook, line, and sinker for that, and they're going to, they're going to be deceived. They're going to be deceived when the false prophet is calling down fire from heaven, when the false prophet is doing signs and wonders as well. And those who are just obsessed with signs and wonders, I know, I mean, as a charismatic believer, as a charismatic leader for most of my adult life, I know how easily us charismatic Pentecostals are, I know how easily persuaded we are by the signs and the wonders movement. And how easily someone coming in doing signs and wonders and power taking place, how easily we can look at that and go, wow, he must be, really be a man of God. God's endorsement must really be on him. I think hopefully we can know from the failures of our past, especially over the past two decades, that signs and wonders and character are very different. Now we want signs and wonders, but signs and wonders are not the ultimate of God's kingdom. We want signs and wonders as a testimony 
uh, of the, to release power and miracles, but it's not the ultimate sign or the ultimate endorsement that God is with us. So I can just imagine when you combine in hyper grace and you combine in partial preterism, you combine in dominionism with its focus on external signs and wonders, and you don't believe that there is coming a coming antichrist, you don't believe there's coming a false prophet, you don't believe there's coming an apostasy, you don't believe any of that because it all took place around 70 AD, you don't believe that, then it could be very easy for, for the revival type churches to be swept away by this religious movement of the antichrist and the false prophet. So those, those doctrines of demons are, are preparing the way And again, I just want to make it very clear. I believe God is going to release a revival, but I call it, I think Mike Bickle called it, I'll just borrow his phrase, a bridal revival. The, the revival God, in my opinion, the revival God intends to release is not a revival that's going to transform nations. It's a revival that's going to transform the bride and prepare her for the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a bridal revival that is going to be unleashed for an inward preparation of the bride to make her ready for the bridegroom. The taking dominion of nations comes in the next age when we return with Jesus Christ. The, cultures, the culture of the nations is not going to become more Christianized. It's going to become actually more anti-Christ-like in its nature. Now, that doesn't mean we accept it. I'm, I've already explained that in a previous teaching. But my point is this. The revival that's coming that God is releasing is, is mainly all about his ultimate intention to be fulfilled, that he would prepare a bride made worthy for Jesus. He would prepare sons of God who have become molded into the image of Jesus Christ. He would prepare a bride or a, a, a people who would be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And again, I want to just clarify this. Some people, when you hear about the false signs and wonders of the Antichrist and the false prophet, they can almost shift into this thing, well, we're not even going to move in any signs and wonders because we don't want to be deceived. Don't do that. The church desperately needs the power of God to demonstrate the kingdom of God in this hour we live in. My feeling is this, is signs and wonders should never be our message. Jesus should be our message. Revival should never be our goal. God's ultimate intention should be our goal. And if, but if we are pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ and we are seeking to see God's ultimate intention fulfilled, God will give us both. God will give us signs and wonders and God will give us the bridal revival that he wants to release. So my point is don't allow the fear of deception to keep you from the authentic miracle working power God does want to release at the end of the age. And so I think even as we bring this session to a close, the, if, you, if you think about we're in, talking about phase one of the apostasy, the preaching of another Jesus, doctrines of demons, the preaching of another gospel, uh, prophecy already being fulfilled, nothing good, nothing bad is coming, and an obsession with signs and wonders. If you combine all of that together, we're going to see the apostasy accelerate at the end of the age. That's why we need to be forewarned about it. That's why we need to be forewarned about it. I think we're already are seeing, uh, even now, the present apostasy as, as many, I would say, uh, numerous once loyal Christ followers are now, quote unquote, deconstructing their faith. And they're going through this thing and they realize they're, they're saying the Bible is not the word of God and Jesus is not the son of God and the Bible is just some handbook to teach us how to be human and not hate and to love and all this nonsense that's being spewed out by, by apostates. And, and, the, and, and the church is already caving in. You think about the church that's already caving in right now with the current cancel culture we live in, where if you say one wrong thing or you do one, one thing that doesn't fit the narrative pushed out by the media and by the government and by big corporation and big tech, if you don't meet that narrative they want you to meet, and you, they'll immediately cancel you. This cancel culture we live in, you know, you think about, you know, denominations are now supporting the LBG, LBGTQ agenda. We got also, even recently, one of the, the largest Christian adoption agencies, because of the pressure of cancel culture, 
their, their long-standing policy to say we're only going to help heterosexual married couples, one man, one woman married, uh, adopt. They have now changed that to say we're going to help homosexual couples adopt. So anyway, the pressure is moving uh, the church and nonprofits to, uh, to really apostatize. That doesn't mean they've apostatized from Jesus, but it does mean they have taken the first step when they have fallen from the truth of what Scripture teaches. And so, I, I, you know, I just think if this Equality Act passes in America, which is now being considered by our Senate, which will codify sexual orientation and gender identity as civil rights issues, and it will have a greater priority over um, someone's religious conviction, I just imagine if that does happen, God forbid that it does. I hope it, I pray and I hope it does not become law in America. But if it does, that is going to accelerate the apostasy in this nation. That is going to accelerate the apostasy in this nation, the defecting from the truth, this bowing down to the culture. And I think if, if that does pass, listen, church, we've got to be willing, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a church, whether you're a Christian, whatever, whatever it is you are, whatever it is you're leading, we've got to be willing to be ostracized if, it's, if that's what it comes to, marginalized if that's what it comes to. If they're going to label us as being whatever they want to label us as, we're going to hold fast to the word of God. We're going to hold fast to the love of God, and we are not going to bend the knee to this cancel culture because ultimately this, this is leading to an even greater apostasy. It's leading to an even greater falling away. We've got to have backbones of steel in this hour we live in. We cannot bow the knee to cancel culture. We've got to be like Daniel who said, I am not going to bow my knee to your idol. Throw me into the uh, flaming furnace. Throw me into the lion's den. I'm not bowing my knee to your pressure. I'm not bowing my knee to your idol. I am not bowing my knee to your agenda. I serve God and God alone. God is able to deliver me if he puts me in the fire. God is able to deliver me if he puts me in the lion's den. God is able to deliver me wherever he places me. We cannot bow the knee to the Antichrist agenda that's rising up in this nation and in the earth. Because if we do, we're going to, it's going to be, you take one step in that direction, it becomes easier to take the next step and the next step until finally you're drinking the wine of Babylon. You're drinking this universal idolatry drink served by harlot Babylon, the end time Babylon, this idea of universalism, that all religions worship the same God. You drink that drink and then it becomes way harder to say no to the allegiance to the Antichrist because that wine of Babylon is preparing the nations to bow the knee to the Antichrist. And so as we wind this up, I'm going to pick up with uh, it, talking about phase two of the apostasy in the next session. We talk about the phase two is going to be like Jezebel, state-sanctioned religion. It's going to be a, the pushing of universalism into the nations to make the world drunk, to prepare the nations to worship the Antichrist. Amen.